Hello everyone! Today is part 4 or episode 4 of the series that is focused on dualities and oppositions and I am going to talk to you today about the Scorpio and Taurus axis. I actually decorated myself in some of the colors that these two signs represent. I just felt like if I'm going to talk about Scorpio and Taurus, the sign of power and abundance, I might as well just glam up for that. Okay, so settle in. We've got a lot to talk about and I even have to resort to some tarot cards to explain the complexities of a Scorpio personality. They're not easy people and they require complicated explanations. But anyway, I'm going to just start off by first focusing on Taurus, then I'm going to move to Scorpio, then I'm going to describe how both of these signs work together, how their energies are complementing each other actually, because the light and the kind of good girl moral person um, facade that Taurus displays usually hides a lot of depth and darkness while a Scorpio is usually one of the most hated persons in the zodiac um, because of their highly emotional and dramatic natures but they actually can be surprisingly reliable and surprisingly loving and committed people. So we're going to be talking about light and darkness. We're going to be talking about Venus and Pluto um, the, co the rulers of um, Taurus and Scorpio. We're going to be talking about extremes of emotion and the quiet pastures of reason. Okay, so settle in. I'm going to, <laughs> to begin by talking first about Taurus. So Taurus. <clears throat> Taurus is represented by the planet of love, Venus. It is slightly different than the energy of Libra because both Libra and Taurus in the astrological wheel are represented by the planet Venus. But while Libra has a sort of mental, intellectual, cultural beauty, it's all about learning about knowledge and I'll expand a bit more on that in the Libra and Aries duality video. The Venus embodiment of Taurus is all about about physical beauty. It's all about the beauty that you can put your hand on and you can touch. So it's about how beautiful your environment is. It's about how beautiful your house is, how beautiful your objects are, how beautiful you are, how beautiful your face, your hair, the way you dress, your clothes. It's this beauty that is very practical, pragmatic. It's about the material abundance, the material aspects of life, the financial aspects of life, okay? Because material goods and finances, self-worth, self-love, and this beauty that you both reflect on the inside and on the outside are all governed by the Venus-Taurus-ruled um, duality. So, when Venus is in the sign of the bull, the second sign of the zodiac, the toddler of the zodiac, it's all about playful um, embodiment. It's all about giving into the senses. It's all about loving how things feel, how they touch, how they smell, how they look, how uh, they taste. Oh my God, food is such a big thing with Taurus people. They basically live for it. They live for the act of eating. Um, and they just live for anything that is related to pleasure. So they, they love to find wine and dine themselves and their lovers. They love to uh, collect cashmere sweaters. They love all these loving, luxurious fabrics. They might have a stack of Egyptian cotton bed sheets. They, they know all of the different beauty products that need to be utilized. They might be into essential oils. They might be into massages. They might be, uh, they're very, very good with their hands. Not to the same um, extent that Geminis are, because Geminis are very good with their hands in a 
kind of uh, they have dexterity they have a very good hand eye coordination they have that kind of nervousness attached to what i see what i think what i can put in my hand and create no taurians are all about my hands are tools to make other people feel and i feel through them as well and i feel my body and i feel the other person's body and i i create and i shift their energy through material means they are redditable this is exactly the word that describes them they are like mountains of solidity both the women and the men they can even physically look like that so they be they can be quite bulky um in their bodies but nonetheless in spite of the fact that they might be maybe more on the generous side maybe more curvy uh they have very beautiful harmonious features so Taurians have this really earthy sensuality that they exude. They have this kind of like stability about them. They magnetize people. You would never see Taurians chasing things. First of all, they hate rushing into things. They hate anything that has to do with rush or chase or, you know, it's, it's all a big stress for them. And secondly, they don't need to rush. They don't need to chase anything because things just naturally gravitate through them because of the fact that they are Venus ruled. So therefore they attract abundance in their life. They have a knack for um, finding trinkets and finding the best kind of deals, uh, gaining the maximum amount of value from an object, from a person, from an experience, but paying very little for it. They are very good at finding bargains. They are very good financial counselors. They are very good at doing your taxes and, you know, anything that is related to banking, anything that is related to accumulating wealth and maintaining it patiently throughout the years so that in time they pay even better dividends. Um, I mean, I'm sure that banks were invented by Taurus people. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure that, you know, investment banking and microfunding and all sorts of things like that were invented by them as well because they are just fascinated with not only having things but multiplying them how can we have more of what we already have how can i get more money more pleasure more material goods and most of them especially the high functioning ones don't do it necessarily from a place of greed. Low functioning Taurus um, people can be so obsessed with pleasure that they just lose their their morals within it. So they can be that kind of uh, man and woman that sleeps around a lot or they can be that person that just indulges in a lot of food and drink and they end up neglecting how those things actually, um, how they got interested in the beginning in loving those things they they end up neglecting that pleasurable aspect they just do it out of a fear or they just do it out of greed and they they end up consuming that beauty that should actually self-replenish itself if that makes sense but anyway what i wanted to say is that um and i'm back sorry guys it's the moon is decreasing at the moment and i'm heavily moon influenced so i need to take several breaks uh throughout making these videos because i do expand a lot of energy when i talk to you about these things i i know so well um so coming back to why do Torians want to produce this more this abundance so as I said, they don't necessarily do it from an evil place or a place that is somehow related to um, obsessively collecting. They are just fascinated with the idea of living a good life, of living a good, moral, fruitful, abundant, fertile lives. They really they not only want to create this for themselves, but they want to inspire other people to do the same. So they might be sometimes uh, a bit bossy in how they come across to other people. They might lecture you on the importance of having to open your own um, savings account or have you tried opening a trust fund for your baby when your baby was born or have you tried getting a better bed in which to sleep because sleep is so important because it gives you energy. 
energy so it's um it's a lot about considering the body as the primary source of our existence here in this reality and therefore we have to take very good care of it we have to nurture it we have to protect it we have to beautify it yeah so that's the the Taurus energy, that's the, the fertile ground on which the bull rests. Um, if you had a look at, um, in the countryside, and you had a look at, you know, cows and bulls um, and how they are, they are just perpetually tranquil. They are so, <laughs> they are so relaxed and they are so accepting of everything. And they spend a lot of their time eating. Now, I'm not saying that this is a direct translation of how... Taurus people are. On the contrary, Taurus people are some of the most ambitious people that you would see out there. They are very goal-driven and they love to um, make lists and proceed to their goals according to those lists. Because one other thing that Taurians are very good at, and it's one of their best qualities if you were to ask me, is their perseverance. You will not find a more dedicated sign than a Taurus. And they don't necessarily do it as Sagittarians would do it because they have a goal and they struck their arrow and they're gonna find it. No, Taurians do it because of a very simple thing called inertia. <laughs> Taurians are perseverant because once they stop, sorry, once they start, <laughs> they cannot stop. It's very, very hard for them. It's very hard for them to get them to do something. And when they manage to, to be convinced, when they manage to organize all the resources and their energy and they say, okay, let's go for this, whether it is a relationship, whether it is a financial endeavor, whether it is building their house, learning uh, for a new degree, moving to another place, whatever it is that they're trying to manifest and whatever it is that they're trying to work at, Victorians start something and they just keep going and going and going and going and going and going and going. And that's, to my mind, one of their best attributes because they are just so set in their ways and they are just so um, set towards um, reaching their destination that they do end up reaching it. And the things that they leave behind, their legacy is astounding, you know. So, for example, um, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, is a Taurus, you know, and he created one of the most uh, successful and popular social media platforms out there. Um, other people, I mean, I, there are so many examples. <laughs> a very, very good example would be Shakespeare. <laughs> he was born in April, towards the end of April as well. And he is, you know, considered the English bard. He basically um, transformed the English language um, and his influence is still felt nowadays. So much like a Capricorn, um, once Torian, Torian people apply their energy to something, whatever they build, build lasts. Because imagine this, they are fixed earth. We, all of us, all of the 12 signs, need earth to live on. <laughs> we need earth, we need to depend on earth. We are reliant on earth to feed us, to support us, gravitationally speaking, to um, nurture us, to quiet us, you know, grounding practices, which are very popular at the moment, especially as we're living in this age of information and we're so much in our heads and so much, so concerned with communication and um, the written, the spoken, the thought word, rather than the body and the physicality that we're having. So all these grounding practices are ruled by Taurus and mother nature you know everything everything that is related to what is natural to the cycles of of nature to the changing of seasons are are primarily anchored in this earthly quality that taurians are so good at supporting so they are the quintessential earth sign they are the strong stable earth sign they are um abundant they are 
prolific, they are beautiful, they are like the Empress card in astrology, sorry, in tarot. So they represent this cornucopia, um, everything that they, um, that they set their mind on and they want to do. Um, has a certain glimmer of gold. They they have this kind of Midas touch to whatever it is that they they put their efforts in. Not only that, but they also have a green thumb. <laughs> I'm full of expressions tonight. Um, but what I mean by this is that if they dedicate themselves to reorganizing a garden or changing the environment in a in a pleasing, beautiful, harmonious way, Taurus can can do that fantastically well because they understand how. Um, how the plants um, in an environment um, need to be organized, what are the temperature, what is the compost soil composition, what is the, uh, the weather specification. Um, they understand all these different things because they feel them through their bodies, they feel them through their senses, so they're highly sensitive to these kind of things. Um, they can make very good um, creators of perfumes, you know, creators of beauty, um, very good fashion editors, some of the best art tours, uh, or fashion designers, okay, so, um, for example, Valentino is a Torian, and he basically redesigned the red dress um, for women, and um, also the classical actress Audrey Hepburn, who is incredibly pixie-like and beautiful, but like beautiful inside and out as well. She also engaged in humanitarian work. She wasn't just uh, um, a pretty face in Hollywood. So there's kind of like this inner and outer beauty that Torians are so good at projecting into the environment. So from the realm of Venusian pleasures, we go now to the opposite of Taurus, Scorpio. <laughs> okay, where do I begin with Scorpio? So, first of all, I'm just going to say it, you know, it's a highly misunderstood sign. It's fantastically misunderstood to the same extent that Geminis and Capricorns tend to irk all the other zodiac signs. Scorpios are perhaps the most misunderstood sign of the zodiac. Mostly because their nature and their psychology and their temperament are very hard to comprehend um, at a first glance. And this is all that you need to know quickly about Scorpio, that it's all about hidden depths. Okay, so whatever you see on the surface has nothing to do with who they really are, with what hides underneath the successful, sexy, um, alluring, positive kind of mask that they have on. And that mask is there for a reason. Now, I'm not saying that behind any successful Scorpio, there is like this uh, little dwarf hiding underneath the cellar. No, that is not necessarily the case, but they are intense individuals. Imagine fixed water. So different to fixed earth, the Taurus exhibit that quality, um, Scorpios are fixed water. They are the most concentrated emotional sign of the zodiac. Now, imagine <laughs> how this plays out, not only if you're a woman, because it's absolutely okay, you know, if you're a woman, Scorpio women are actually some of the most alluring, some of the most sexy, some of the most feminine women of the zodiac. But imagine if you're a man and you're one of the most emotional signs <laughs> of the zodiac. How do you cope with a society? How do you cope living in a society that tells you that the measure of a man's strength is how much he controls, suppresses, represses those emotions and shows stoicism and shows emotional control and shows stamina and shows sexuality and shows aggressiveness rather than vulnerability, emotional openness, candor, fragility, warmth tenderness okay so there is a lot of um 
repression that goes on with Scorpios. This happens from a very young age. They are ruled by the planet Pluto. Pluto in itself is a highly, highly controversial planet because some people argue that it's not a planet. It's just perhaps a satellite, a dwarf planet. I personally like to give it its full-blown status of planet. It was discovered as a planet. It was coined as a planet. Um, and it had a, a very important influence on mass collective um, once it was discovered. And it kind of propelled us into progressions in terms of science with the discovery of the atomic bomb. It's usually associated with this kind of nuclear energies. It's quite tiny, but quite powerful. It is the planet that lies at the outskirts of our solar system. Tiny, yet powerful. Um, some people have um, argued that, you know, um, there are some sort of craters on Pluto's um, in interface that look like a heart, <laughs> a heart-shaped crater. Um, I'm not really sure. I've seen a couple of those photos. I'm not really convinced it's a heart, but that's really beautiful to try to consider that there is this kind of like small planet with a contested title that dwindles on the outskirts of our universe, of our galaxy, sorry, not universe, of our galaxy, and has this gigantic heart-shaped crater on it. It's kind of, there's something poetic there about it, and it kind of shows a little bit how Scorpio, how Scorpio life is all about, because it's a lot about being socially excluded. It's a lot about being misunderstood. It's a lot about having your desires not fully comprehended by many people in your life. It's a lot about having to hide who you really are because mm, social norms don't really deal with um, the themes that Scorpio's lives are all about. Death, rebirth, transformation, extreme sexuality, um, intensity in everything that they do everything so it's not just intensity in you know um the way that they work it's intensity in how they work how they love how they have a family how they protect others how they create how they form groups how they relate to others the interesting thing about scorpios is that they are a lot about fear and overcoming that fear. Much like Capricorns, they're very similar to Capricorns and unsurprisingly, they tend to become best friends. And I've seen a lot of Scorpio and Capricorn couples because they seem to understand one another because of the fact that they have to deal uh, with so much hardship in their lives. They tend to form um, a friendship around that. But as I said as well in another video, they also tend to create a lot of hardships for other people if they don't understand the fact that their lives are supposed to be ruled by these really strange, odd undercurrents. Let me give you just an example. If you're a Scorpio, no matter what happens in your life, no matter how reasonable you're trying to be, no matter how rational, how... Um, well, you were educated, you might come from a very good background, you might come from a rich family. There is something in your life that has to do with the occult. There is some sort of happening that has to do with the occult. You are never away from magic. Never. So, for example, um, in some people's families, when a Scorpio baby is born, somebody else has to die. So, there is this exchange that is happening between a life is taken a life is given and the life that came into that family to purge the family of ancestral trauma relies right now on the Scorpio baby whether it is a boy or a girl so they come into life directly placed into these situations of power of guilt of shame of um sometimes even mystical things like they they tend to not be accepted for who they are but everybody in their family projects the image of their great grandfather onto them because that great grandfather i don't know 
disappeared in mysterious circumstances and the baby really reminds people in the family of that great great grandfather so they live from day one with this great responsibility of having to live up to an image that is not their own they might be born with um non-heteronormative desires so for example they might be a woman very attracted to other women or a man very attracted to other men and they come into a staunchly catholic family deal with that you know like you're going to have to fight through your relations and have to convince people to accept your sexuality and who you really are Either that or they're born in a favela or in a shanty town and they have to fight for their resources, they have to fight for their survival basically from day one, you know. Um, it, it's all sorts of very bizarre circumstances or there were situations where you have like conjoined twins in the womb and one the, the twin has to eat the other one to survive. These are themes that sometimes happen in, in Scorpio stories. So there might be also situations where um, maybe a parent has a child and that child dies under mysterious circumstances and then the next baby that the family has, it's a Scorpio and that the the death of the first baby is con is considered as a prolongation of the Scorpio baby's life or some sort of weird shame that the mother might have uh, regarding the loss of the first baby is now being projected onto the Scorpio baby. They might also be born in families of great wealth that was acquired through savagery, like colonial empires. Um, those dynasties, families that have actually earned their wealth through colonizing and, and, you know, destroying the lives of people that they basically stole from other countries and dragged into their own countries to, to force to work, like slavery and, you know, slave um, owners and plantation owners and so on and so forth. So Scorpios are born into these families to purify these um, ancestral traumas but they're not aware of this. So they come into the life and they expect to be loved. They expect to be understood, just like all of us. But with Scorpio, it's even stronger. It's like they don't expect it. They rely on this love for their survival, so they think. So the first part of their life might be very, very strongly filled with traumas, trauma after trauma. They expect love, but all they get is hardship. All they get is this weird projection. All they get is people telling them what to do. They get their power um, completely taken from them. People trespass their boundaries, whether it is in financial ways or sexual ways. They might be sexually abused as well. They might be relationally uh, overwhelmed. They might be emotionally overwhelmed and people don't know how to get them to handle their very strong and intense emotions because there is a fantastic fear of separation with them. They come into this world with such a strong um, separation anxiety. And every time somebody leaves them, every time they are left to their own devices, they get so strongly triggered. So... They have to deal with this fear that exists in their life, with these projections that exist in their life, with their strong emotional nature that never meets something that can quench it, that can calm it, that can hold it. And they go through these periods when they reach a plateau where they realize, fuck, what have I placed myself into? What is the situation? Something has to change. This person has to go away. I have to change. I have to go away. My family has to change. My financial situation has to change. The environment has to change completely. And that is the moment of rebirth. So they have these moments, these intense panic attacks, these intense emotional meltdowns, only to help them rise up to their power. So it's almost as if something pushes them, pushes them, pushes them, pushes them until they just say enough and they rise up and they embody that power that they naturally came into this world with. So they go through deaths and rebirths periodically throughout their lives only to realize that they are the power, that they are the love, that they are the 
this fantastic individual that they have always been looking somehow outwards of themselves to find, but they are this person. They are this powerful individual. And instead of victimizing themselves, because that is such a big theme with Scorpios, they victimize themselves and they think, oh no, this is happening to me again. Why? If they stop and ponder and they think through their feelings, because they think through their feelings rather than the other way around. They think first and then feel. No, they feel first and then they think. They stop and ponder. Maybe this is happening to me because I am strong enough to handle it. Maybe I've been placed in this family because I have the power to change things around me. Maybe my drama and my chaos is not about, oh, poor little me. Why can't I get all these things I want? <laughs> Sorry about that. But it's about, I am an emotional rock. I need to become an emotional rock for myself and for others to stabilize the situation, to transform it, to purify it, to make it from something that was so oppressive into something free and liberating, to purge it through the fire of my own soul and desire to purge everything that comes into contact with me and make it whole and make it pure and make it clean again and make it full of light and give it a breath of fresh life because the amazing thing about Scorpios and that's one of the things I absolutely love about them they bring people to life okay whether it is through having sex with them whether it is through uh falling in love with them and telling them how they really feel, whether it is through how they work with people, whether it is most of the time they are engaged in work that is deeply meaningful to them, whether it is political or humanitarian or social. They, they love to just work for a cause and they love to stick it up to the man and be rebels to a very similar extent to Aquarians, but Aquarians do it from a very mental, humanitarian kind of, ooh, let's create inventions for the world. Um, while Scorpios do it like no social justice, you know. Uh, we found out a deep, dirty secret and we have to fight against the injustice and we have to purify the, the scourge of society. So there's that kind of Batman theme going on with them. <laughs> Very, very, very deeply, I think, um, the character of Bruce um, in Batman is actually inspired by, by Scorpio personality. Um, and also the city in which he lives, Gotham, and all the darkness around it. It's so much, it's such Scorpio themes. And also the fact that he's born in a very rich family and his parents die and he goes through all the trauma. So it's a lot about that. It's a lot about... Death, rebirth, transformation, rejuvenation. The strength, not of the physicality that Taurians bring, but the strength of your emotions, of your desires. Okay, so I feel like I've been really into that, but I wanted to show you guys as well the stages of the Scorpio transformation because a lot of people talk about, you know, a high-functioning and a low-functioning Scorpio and you might hear people talk about Phoenix or Eagle um kind of qualities so how do these <laughs> it's gonna be such a long video but i don't care because i really enjoy doing these things for you guys so how do taurians and scorpio energy how do they function together so as i said you have the planet of beauty venus and the planet of transformation and death pluto bring them together what do you get you get <laughs> A beauty of the soul that comes from it being purified over and over again until it becomes this amazing light. You get a bare nakedness of vulnerability, Scorpio, that comes into contact with the green calm pastures of the cosmic bull, okay, Taurus. A support in the middle of a tempest. Death and fertility. Sometimes in order to produce 
better fruits or to produce better um, grapes on a vine, you have to burn it down. You have to burn the ground down. Then the ground replenishes itself through the ashes and you get a fantastically abundant crop in the coming years. That is the energy of the Taurus and Scorpio axis. Where Taurians become too superficial and too much about their looks and too much about their vanity, they tend to attract Scorpios into their lives that purify that, that call them out on their bullshit, that take the mask off in a very, well, sometimes in quite in a very shocking kind of, whoa, what's happening kind of way. Taurians are so much guided by their high morals, by their principles, by what does it mean to be a good person? I want to be a good, moral-sounding individual. They can be quite judgmental as well sometimes. A low-functioning Taurus can be so dogmatic and so judgmental and trying to shove down your throat their, their ideas. And they can be only their ideas. And if you disagree with them, they will fight you for that. And they are so incredibly stubborn and resilient in their thinking. But a high-functioning Taurus is very comfortable with their dark side, is very comfortable with an understanding that in order to be um, a being that is moral and good, you have to accept your defects, you have to accept your shadow, you have to incorporate the Scorpio polarity into you, that need for power. Because Taurians do enjoy being very powerful, being those individuals that people look up to in society, being those friends that people turn to for advice, being those people that just can solve a situation by taking out their paycheck and it's all solved, you know, I've taken care of you. So a high functioning Taurus is very comfortable with the darkness of their material and financial desires. They are familiar with the fact that they might be greedy the fact that they might be dogmatic, but they transmute that. They realize that it is actually really good that I am in this way, that there are some limitations placed on my very strong, deep desires. A high-functioning Scorpio, on the other hand, loves themselves. That is possibly the hardest lesson for a Scorpio to understand in this lifetime to love themselves to appreciate themselves just as they are as i mentioned previously in the description of the psychological mechanisms that take place from a very early age with scorpios they are being taught to hate themselves they are being taught to not like themselves they are being taught unconsciously by the people around them that they are projections of other people so their toughest lesson to learn in this lifetime is to love themselves and by loving themselves, by being sensitive to their selves, to their needs, they transmute all of those desires. They go past, they purge their obsessions because their obsessions are just energy that is locked within and it keeps going in and in and in. And the only way that they could actually, you know, disarm the obsession bomb or the obsession loop is to bring light into it, is to bring love into it. The only way that they can stop obsessing over why didn't I get that job? Why didn't I get that person? Why doesn't this person want to sleep with me? Why don't I get the money? Why don't I get the power? Is to come back to their selves to put a lot of love into themselves, a lot of care. And by doing this, they learn as well how to empathize with other people. Because one of the things that is so hated about Scorpios is that they are self-obsessed. They are so focused on themselves. Even though they have so much to bring to the table. They are quite sexy and alluring and they draw people in very quickly. But those people most of the time just want them for one thing, which is sex. They don't really appreciate them for who they are as souls, for who they are as thinkers, as feelers. 
And that's mostly because they don't appreciate it themselves. So they don't think that they are good for anything better than that. But they are. And they have to wise up to this realization. And that is the strongest lesson that a Scorpio has to learn in this lifetime. That they are worthy. Taurus. Worth. They are worthy. Their emotions matter. Their emotions bring value. They they can be tender. They can be soft with themselves and with other people. They don't have to show this facade, this wall of power. They can, they can be vulnerable and strong at the same time. And here I really re would like to recommend, if you guys are Scorpios and watching this, or you know, if you are, have no Scorpios and are watching this and are interested, please go and read Brenna Brown's book, Daring Greatly. She's a Scorpio herself. And in her TED Talk, she actually described how she functioned from the same mechanism. She was kind of educated as a Texan to just believe in stoicism and not have to deal with vulnerability. Ugh, what is that? And how the book actually says how her story through gathering her research is all about getting more in touch with the idea that wholehearted people are vulnerable people, those people that wear their hearts on their sleeves. And no matter how much life disappoints them and gets them into these places where they could fall into self-loathing, they choose love. They choose to live wholeheartedly. They choose to go again and fall in love, go again and be kind, go again and... Um, you know, fight the dark with kindness, killing people with love. <laughs> That's basically the combination of Taurus and Scorpio. Scorpio, death, killing, and and Taurus, love, worth. So killing people with kindness, killing people with love, bombarding them, perseverantly bombarding people with lessons in self-worth, lessons in self-empowerment. Yeah, it, just just empowering people to who they really are. Because a high-functioning Scorpio is no longer at the level of a small critter that hides in a cave and um, is very protective and would sting others, but by this they also kill themselves. No, that's so that's a low-functioning Scorpio. A high-functioning Scorpio is one that has been through a phoenix moment or a couple of phoenix moments. God knows that, you know, they're going to be going through a couple of them throughout their lives. So they burned, they burned, they, they suffered, they reached a plateau, they suffered and they burned. So the suffering purified them. Why do they suffer? Because of ego. Because their egos are so very strongly protected. So... The fire of the phoenix comes forth, burns their ego, burns their ego attachments, and it transforms them into the ego. Okay, so this is the high functioning polarity of Scorpios. So, why an eagle? Because an eagle is a bird of prey that is able to see the bigger picture. When a Scorpio is functioning at a low level, they are so self-obsessed. They are so obsessed with what they can grab and hold and touch. And it's all this kind of clamming for survival. It's all this kind of like, ah, I'm going to dominate you because I don't want to be dominated. I'm going to hurt you because I don't want to be hurt. I'm going to be dramatic right now because I react on the spot. And by this, they give their power away. And other people can take advantage of them because other people might be more rational and you can realize, oh, Okay, so this is how you react. They can manipulate you. But if they have reached the level of ego, they can just lie back in their power and realize there is nothing that you can take away from me because I am this power. There is nothing that I will go through that will ultimately kill me because I am strong enough to rise up after every challenge. I'm rising up again and again and again and again and again. And this is where they borrow the Taurus perseverance. There is nothing that people can hurt them with because people can't hurt you if you won't let them hurt you. It's as simple as that. It's an act of will. 
if a person comes at you with hurt, you can counteract that with kindness, with love, with acceptance. And that's one of the strongest lessons that Scorpios not only can learn, but they can teach others once they reach this level. And once they've been through a couple of painful Phoenix moments. I really hope that this makes sense. I hope that, that I know this video is quite long, but I hope that it helped couple of you out there that are Taurus or Scorpios or are in relationship with Taurus and Scorpios. I wanted to spend more time on this axis because I don't think a lot of people understand it very well. I myself have struggled to understand why Taurus and Scorpio people act in the ways that they do. But um, the more I grow and I learn as well and work on my self-awareness and self-development, I am much more able to understand them and much more able to, to figure out what is happening there. They're not easy people to understand, to live with, but they are incredibly reliable. Um, they're very strong. They are very yin-based energy. Both Taurians and Scorpios are highly feminine signs um, because they are so in touch with with the light and the dark aspect of beauty, whether it is physical and sexual and alluring or internal and emotional and empowering and inspiring and that kind of beauty that shines from people that have been through so much in their life but are still standing and are even protecting others that have been through the same kind of stories through them. So Scorpions, high functioning Scorpions make amazing trauma counselor, amazing war conflict negotiators. They are so good in, in situations of crisis because they bring that Taurian polarity, this kind of strong center in a situation of ultimate chaos, of ultimate destruction, where other signs might lose their proverbial shit. Scorpions are just like, no. I shine at things like this. It's a crisis moment. Here I am, baby. I'm going to take care of everyone. And Taurians are just basically these pools of, of beauty and love, these kind of generators of um, wealth and peacefulness. Um, but they do have to watch out for being greedy. They do have to watch out for not letting their desires and their senses lead them down a path of destruction and ultimately they might end up losing everything that they wanted and they created. Um, so they, they should continue to live moral and, and light, lives full of light while also incorporating a bit of their own darkness because the Taurus and Scorpio polarities duality, sorry, it's all about light and darkness. It's all about rebirth and regeneration, abundance and transformation. Okay, guys. <laughs> wow, I feel like this has been such a big expanse of energy. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please comment, please like, share, subscribe, comment on anything you want, the thing that helps me get the message out there is going to make me a very happy person. So if you want to help me out, then please do some of those things I just mentioned and tap the bell to receive notifications. Anyway, I'm going to leave you here, my sweets. I hope you have a lovely night and I wish you all the best. See you next time. Bye.